Hi, my name is Taryn and welcome to a British audio file and a new series. I haven't even decided what I'm going to call this yet. Something like hi-fi tips, hi-fi uh, talks, something like that. Normally what I do on this channel is I review audio components. I talk about some of the technical aspects of hi-fi. It gets a little heavy at times. This series is going to be a little different. It's as if you kind of met me down the pub and we're having a chat. I'm going to share with you my own personal thoughts and feelings about um, a product. When I'm reviewing components, I try and be as objective as I can, try and remove my personal bias. This series is not going to be like that. So I'm going to pick a, to pick, pick a particular topic and just discuss that. The first topic I'm going to choose is money budgeting. It's questions that I probably get asked the most by people who aren't into this kind of audio hobby and want to put together a hi-fi system, got something like a Sonos or a MIDI system at home. They'll ask me, well, how much do I need to spend on a hi-fi system and what should I buy? Well, let's talk about the first question. How much you should spend on a hi-fi system is going to be based on your disposable income and what your expectation levels are in terms of performance. In theory, at least, the more money you spend, the better the performance should be. Now, most people are kind of comfortable spending three, four hundred pounds on a Sonos or a MIDI system. It's possible for the same money you can put together a hi-fi system that will blow that out of the water in terms of sonic performance. So what are some of my favorite brands? Well, let's start with speakers first. If you're looking at kind of entry-level bookshelf speakers, I like stuff from Wharfdale, and Q Acoustics, I think for 100, 150 pounds, they offer products that are excellent value for money. Stick that with an entry level Denon or Marantz amplifier, 150, 200 pounds. And uh, also some of the entry level from amplifiers from Cambridge Audio. And the only thing you then need to do is connect it to some kind of source. Well, you can use your phone, you can use your computer, but I wouldn't rely on the internal digital to analog converter. An off-board DAC, AudioQuest Dragonfly, if you just need USB connections. Um, I think Cyrus do one, which is like 60 quid as well. So 400 quid or so, you're off to the races. Now, if you've got a bigger room, you're going to need a more powerful amplifier and bigger speakers. You're going to have to spend a little bit more money, six, 700 pounds, and away you go. I've heard systems over the years at all kinds of price points, 200 pounds, 2,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, 200,000 pounds. If you're asking me personally how much I'd spend on a hi-fi system to be able to live with for the rest of my life, I have put together a system recently in my bedroom for 2,000 pounds that I'm quite happy with if that was my entire system and I was that's all I was listening to. Now I get that 2,000 pounds is quite a lot of money for a lot of people but I'm just talking about what my own personal beliefs are here. So, John, At I'm not the only one, by the way. John Atkinson, some of you will know who he is, some of you won't. He was up until recently the editor-in-chief of Stereophile. That's a very prestigious publication in the United States. He has access to anything um, that he wants, essentially, and his main listening system at home is centered around Kef LS50 speakers. That's an 800 pound uh, speaker that he's built a system around. In my bedroom, I built a system around PSB Imagine Mini speakers. Now, PSB is one of my favorite brands of speakers. I don't understand why they don't sell in the bucket loads in the UK. They produce, Paul Barton, the designer of that is a very value orientated kind of um, individual. He tries to squeeze as much performance as he possibly can out of a box. He's an absolute genius. I can go into the research of what he's done with the NRC and Dr. Floyd tool and bore you to death, but that's not for this format. What I'm saying is I put, there's a 600 pound speaker that I've built a system around with an audio lab amplifier and DAC that I think retailed back then for about 900 quid. Um, they're tiny little speakers so I've got two PSB little subwoofers in there I think the subwoofers are little five inch drivers kind of cinema little subwoofer I don't know what they call it what do they call it PSB cinema 50 or something anyway it's a tiny little subwoofer it's got two of those just to fill out the sound because I like to have a little bit of bass um, 
two grand that system absolutely stunning in terms of its performance not a million miles away from my main rig which costs probably four times that so that's my own personal belief of where i'd spend my money now if you're spending a couple of thousand pounds on a hi-fi system this is where active systems come into the mix i'll just briefly explain what an active system is without getting into too much technical detail that's probably a talk for another time and another video Active systems are where you have the amplifier and electronic crossover built into the speaker itself. And this has some distinct sonic benefits over the traditional separate box kind of arrangement. What you normally have in an active system is a separate amplifier for the woofer and a, another amplifier for the tweeter. So those amplifiers are designed and optimized to work with those drive units, which has a sonic benefit. Also, there's a sonic benefit to having an electronic crossover as opposed to kind of the passive crossover that you have in a traditional speaker. Electronic crossovers means that each drive unit only receives the signal it's supposed to receive. In a traditional speaker, what a crossover has to do is filter the signal out to the woofer so that you essentially only get the low frequencies to the woofer and similarly filter the signal out to the tweeter so that all you get is essentially the high frequencies to the tweeter. This passive crossover that you have in a traditional speaker is problematic, it's lossy, it doesn't behave linearly and there's a lot of problems doing it in the electronic domain has some distinct sonic benefits. Because everything's in one box you generally get a little bit more bang for your money so there's a couple of good um, active systems out there for £2,000. Ones that get a lot of attention are the KEF um, LS50 wireless system. That's a little bit on the bright side. It has built-in DACs as well, so you literally just plug and play. Your digital components will plug straight into that. If you want something a little bit warmer and richer sounding, the ELAC Navis um, designed by Andrew Jones, again, for a couple of grand is a good system. If you're not spending a couple of thousand pounds on a hi-fi system and you want the convenience to have the amplifiers built into the box, you should consider a powered loudspeaker. Now that's similar to an active design. You've got the amplifiers built in, but it hasn't got the fancy electronic crossover. And there's some good options out there. I think for 200 pounds, Edifier do some good solutions. You can get them off Amazon. A friend of mine's got those. He's perfectly happy with them. And I've heard the 400 pound offerings from companies like Audio Engine and Canto. And I think they represent good value by having the amplifiers built in. You probably get a little bit more for your money than perhaps having separate boxes. The downside is of course, you don't have the upgradability option. So it's a solution really for people who want to buy a system and forget about it and aren't really interested in tweaking it and upgrading it later down the line. The last thing that I want to talk about when we're talking about money is the value proposition of used gear. I'm going to separate this out into two camps, analog uh, components and digital components. When I'm talking about analog side, I'm talking about amplifiers and speakers. Digital is streamers, DACs, CD players. I'd be reluctant to spend a lot of money on used digital components. And the reason is that the game moves on pretty quickly. It's still a maturing technology. It changes very uh, rapidly. And a 2,000 pound DAC from five years ago is probably outperformed by a 500 pound DAC today. So if you're buying digital components, they need to be really cheap if you're buying them secondhand. The same isn't quite true on the analog side. There have been innovation. There's been things like class D uh, amplifiers, which I think certainly more at the kind of budget and kind of mid hi-fi end have um, really changed things, um, moved the game on. But the vast majority of amplifiers out there are still class AB. And that is a mature technology that has evolved slowly. There have been refinements, but it hasn't radically changed. And I think the same is true for essentially speakers. There's been innovations in some of the materials used, and that has probably represented better value at the budget end, but good quality amplifiers and good quality speakers from 20 years ago represent good value on the second hand. If they're bought at the right price, can be really good value um, on the second hand market. 
If you're buying used gear out there, you need to be careful. There are a number of pitfalls, especially if you're new to this hobby. The most obvious one being reliability. Used amplifiers and speakers may have electrolytic capacitors in there that need replacing over a period of time because they tend to dry out. They may have dry solder joints that need attention. And the most significant problem is if they've been overdriven in some way that they may well have heat damage that you can't see when you're looking out the outside of the component. Speaker woofers have a surround, that's the bit that goes around the outside of a cone. They tend to perish over a period of time and they may need replacing. And you might think you can just get an equivalent size of eBay and plonk it on there, but that will change the characteristics of the driver and the characteristics of the sound. It helps if you've got a service engineer or a service center nearby that you can rely upon, but replacement parts aren't always available. So you might want to check that out before you go down the use route. I personally would buy from someone who I knew had looked after the product reasonably well, or even better still from a dealer that um, I have some comeback on if there is a problem further down the line. The other thing with used gear is that it tends to have more of a colored sound. They're not all warm and cozy. You can get bright and edgy used gear, but there tends to be more of a sonic characteristic to used equipment you may or may not like. Less uh, so in modern gear. They tend to have ironed out some of those kind of idiosyncrasies over the last couple of decades. So again, if you're buying used, you need to check out that actually the sonic flavor of that particular item is to your liking. So that kind of pretty much covers what I want to speak about in this kind of informal chat. Hopefully you've enjoyed this kind of more personal uh, kind of informal take on uh, hi-fi. If you have, please hit the like button. Please share this video. Please consider subscribing if you haven't subscribed already. But for today, for now, a British audiophile signing off. Thank <laughs> you.